Hey guys, Andrea, welcome back to the channel. So guys, come back from Community Access. Now, I've got talking to a new support worker. She's been on my team, absolutely lovely. And I think this is a video that is long overdue. So it's working with a support worker. So the first thing is working out what style of support suits you. So there's a couple of different styles. So you can go with agency, private, as the two main ones in generally choosing a support worker. But then knowing what types of support and help you need with. Is it activities of daily living? Is it household health? Is it life skills? What is it community engagement? Is it community participation? So that will then narrow it down further. Within a support worker, there's a couple of different styles of support. And it depends on the ratio that you are when you have your functional capacity assessment done by the OT or a mental health professional or a positive behaviour support practitioner. Really important to get that done at the moment because NDIS is moving away from diagnosis basis to how the disability, health condition or mental illness affects you day to day. So as I've said in the previous video, a lot of people are getting diagnosed and then having the shock and the horror of the realisation that diagnosis doesn't always equal access. There is list A, B and C. List A is automatic access. This B requires minimal evidence. This C is you have to prove diminished capacity. And this is where the couple of different styles of support comes in. So your active support and your passive support. And active support is doing things with the support worker. Not having them do it for you, but doing it with them. So prime example, everyone had two or three items that needed wash today. We've had a break in the rain. I when it combined it made a full load. When I came home from community access, it had been put in the dryer. That's a thing of active support. Someone noticing that you've stepped up to the plate and therefore going, okay, well, it'll help that person manage her energy levels by doing that. Then within active support, you have something called high intensity support. And so this is generally for people who have behaviours of concern, difficult and challenging behaviours, manipulative behaviours, oppositional defiance disorder, conduct disorders, things where they're going to lash out, harm themselves, harm others, try and manipulate people where that person needs eyes on them 24-7 and the only time eyes can be off them is when they're asleep. They also might have bed alarms to let them know that they're wandering or restrictive practices such as bed rails. And this is where you make a case for bed rails being a safety issue as well. They, so a lot of restrictive practices, when it boils down, when you've got the appropriate trained staff, the appropriate the views, so it's gone through a positive behaviour support practitioner, consequences have been enforced, and the staff are appropriately trained in using those boundaries, there is a case for some restrictive practices that we can make that some would be called common sense. I know Deb and I have talked about this when I was highly overcaffeinated on the channel. So things like locking up sharp containers, having medication away from the common areas, having names on food, having locks on fridges, having lockable personal areas. So that's bathroom, toilet, shower, that's bedrooms as well. So that's your high intensity support. So someone who has got high additional support needs. So that might be that they're schizophrenic, they're paranoid, they have a general mental diminished capacity. It might be that they have other paranoid delusions um, to, to keep them eating. 
they need that level of support. Then you have your passive support. So this is more when you've got different ratios of care. So ratios of care can go from one on one, one to two, one to three, and then as the group size increases, depending on the ratio of care of that person, the support workers will increase. Um, the biggest number I've heard in a house in my area is 10, and I've heard that there was three support workers in that house at all times, and that the higher functioning people did have chores that they were responsible for doing. So things like laundry, washing up, folding up, setting the dinner table, um, with support workers preparing veggies, mopping, vacuuming, all things that kept that house running smoothly and taught them life skills as well. So then your passive support is basically the support worker is favouring another person, giving them the attention that they need because you need less support. And then just doing a check-in once, twice a year, seeing if you need support. And so that's they're being active with one person, but passive in the other, when the other one is high functioning and the other one has the common sense or the mental capacities to be able to call out, use a call bell, use a communication device if they need that help. And so that leads us to our next topic of how to work with a support worker. Because a lot of people get their first plan, get a support worker, and it's like, okay, well, what do we do now? So that's the first thing is know where you fit in. Are you a home and community access client so that they can help at both at home and getting you into the community? Is it that once you hit the day of community centre, they're able to help and assist you with the activities of the plan for that day? Is it that they're just community access? Is it that they're just in the house? So figure out where you fit in into that system, really important. Um, important that you know your ratio of care as well because some people unfortunately due to funding issues evidence issues support workers not knowing how to document or feeling that documenting incidents is a reflection on them where it's actually not a reflection on them it's a reflection on the person's behavior and that then can go towards us having the right funding for the right level of care. So knowing what you want to do in the day and getting into a really good routine, really important. So for me in the house, support workers are able to help with light housework, though they do have the rule of three. I try to tr do it myself three times before I go and ask for help. Um, I've been on an absolute roll with my food hygiene, my washing up and my laundry and it's like I'm waiting for the crash I know I shouldn't be but I'm waiting for the crash but that is capacity building knowing that I can do that for myself and that I will look and go oh that's a full load let's get that load sorted like hang on I'm doing xyz tomorrow so I need to pack my backpack for that. I need to check the weather radar. I need to edit a video. I need to record content. And putting that on the whiteboard so everyone knows where I'm at with that. So they don't come in while I'm accidentally filming. That is something that is really important of having a direction of where you want to go with that support worker. Um, that might be literally, so do you want to go to the local museum? Do you want to go to the local park? Do you want to go swimming? The gym, it's all around your goals in the NDIS because the NDIS isn't about de-skilling people and getting them into learnt dependence. So de-skilling is where you leave things for support worker to do on the premise that they are not busy. They, in my housing facility, are running all the time. On the weekends, they do have a chance to sit down and build relationships with us. 
but very rare in some shifts. But in other shifts, there is not much to do, so they can build relationships, get to know you, get to know your needs. Um, this is where, counter to a lot of other disabled content creators, I'm like, yeah, read the farm. Read my farm, please. Because that's how they can get to know me and my diagnoses and hit the ground running. Especially if it's an emergency situation, you're better off knowing what that client's potential needs are than having to play catch up. So that's another thing is if it's one-on-one -on -one in community, have a plan of attack. So my plan of attack today was getting a quote to get my computer fixed, picking up some printer ink, going and doing a small grocery shop that turns into a very large grocery shop, dropping some things off the local library so I didn't end up with a library fine. Um, so you can see that they're all fairly mundane tasks, but because I can't drive, I need to be organised and on it as well. Then Wednesday, because normally that would be my shopping day, going on the day trip with my community services organisation, needed to have things in place, so pre-recorded content, content edited, content uploaded, so working on that now. And that's the other thing is, Working with the support worker, there's another thing is you need to respect their boundaries and that's turning up on time, so being organised, dressed and ready to go. Respecting what they can and can't do for you. Respecting their personal life. They're a support worker. They're not your friends. They can be friends outside of work. Yeah, sure. You might employ a friend as a support worker. Sure but that becomes a professional working relationship. So there needs to be professional boundaries kept, and that means sticking to their approved shift times. And they might have another shift afterwards. They might need to pick up kids from school. They might need to pick up a spouse from work. They might need to pick up a child from daycare. So that's the other thing. But at the same time, respecting those boundaries, but being a bit interested in their life as well. Not gossiping, not pushing boundaries, but if you know that you've got kids at school, being polite and asking about how the kids are doing at school, asking about the husband or the wife, just having that general interest and not having it all about you. And this is the thing, and finding the right support worker is going to take time. Might take a couple of agencies because not every organization not every support worker suits everyone but you need to respect them that is something that i've learned the hard way you need to respect them as well and that's another thing with community access and data center is respect the activities that they've got on participate and if you want to do something suggest it they might be able to add it to the roster for next month or next year Suggest it, be involved, go and try, be engaged. Don't be that seller who's sulking at the back of the room because you're forced to go. You can ask to go and try another day centre. So you can ask for mental health days. Just check your service agreement and your contract around hours. So guys, I hope that helped and gave you a few tips about working with a support worker. And if you're a support worker who follows the channel, definitely drop me the line, tips and tricks you have for onboarding a new client, what you expect of clients, what you do if clients are disrespecting you, disrespecting your boundaries, saying that you're a friend rather than a support worker, what do you do to redirect them? So guys, thank you so much for making it to the end of the video. Uh, guys, still 70% of you guys are unsubscribed to the channel. Really helps if you subscribe. So we've got a subscriber only newsletter as well. Vibrant community over there. So if you can like, share, comment, subscribe, really helps. And I have dropped new content over on Patreon. There's always Patreon if you want to financially support me. I know things are tight at the moment. 
But guys, if you have the funds to support me, that's at $3 a week. And there is a free tier as well. So guys, thank you so much for watching.